will, uh, we started off with Wes and Rachel and uh, their story, and then we had Elena and her story. And there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know about Elena's story. Uh, then we had Darce and Tina, and that was a good story. They, they shared their story with us. And we're, we're, the story is about how did we come into this grace? Why, why do we even have a church called Grace Life Center and, and all these things? So it's, uh, I don't have the, the book. <laughs> I'm just looking at this book I don't have. Uh, and so everybody's journey is a little bit different. And uh, that's one of the things I want everybody to know is that where you are, it's okay uh, because everybody's journey is different. Uh, and you're gonna hear a different perspective and a different journey tonight. So we've got Corey and Joanne Johnston with us. And uh, they've been with us. They've been with us right from the very beginning uh, when we started. And uh, man, I just appreciate this couple so much. Uh, Joanne is our administrator now at the church, and she does all those bulletins and the uh, prayer uh, lists, uh, calendars, and different things like that. If you need anything, you just contact her, and uh, and she's going to make sure those things get done. Uh, Corey sits on our board, and uh, we just appreciate his voice. Uh, we should have a board meeting soon, eh? Uh, anyways, <laughs> but uh, we appreciate his voice on, on our board as well. So we're just going to get right into it. I've got seven <laughs> questions. People said, that's more than seven questions. There's seven questions with a whole bunch of sub-questions. <laughs> And so uh, whoever goes first goes first. I know that I see somebody's got notes and somebody doesn't have notes, so somebody's going to wing it. And someone says, i got to write this out. Uh, I want you to tell us uh, what growing up looked like for you guys. Uh, what did, you, or did your parents take you to church? Uh, and if they did take you to church, what kind of church did you attend? And what was your experience like? What, what was it like growing up? Where did you grow up? Uh, whoever's going to start. Share that with us tonight first. Ladies first. Is your microphone on? Is there a green light? Button right in the middle of the... Now it is? Okay, good. Ladies first, he says. What a gentleman you have. <laughs> uh, I grew up uh, rural Osler, and I grew up in a Christian home. Um, church was just something that was just something we did. And my grandpa was actually the Altista of the old colony Mennonite church. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Altista? Altista. Okay, I don't even know what Altista is. So it's I don't like, know what Altista is. Is there anybody else that wants to know what Altista is? Okay. It's, I, was, I was looking it up. Bishop is not even the right term for it, but it's like an elder, but the way they esteem elders in the old colony Mennonite is... What, do you have enough, Would you know how to explain that? Basically, the leader. The leader. highest person that he could. So you're the daughter of the pope. Is that what we could kind of? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. The pope of the old colony church. <laughs> the pope of the old colony church. Okay. Okay. I'm a part of that heritage. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what age I was, but I was fairly young when we ended up switching from the old colony Mennonite and going to the Burke Taller Church. So that was my entire entire years growing up. It was always for taller church. Yeah, and your experience, like, did you was it an enjoyable experience as a kid, or uh, what what kind of? Uh, let's is that see. The next question. No, no, that's as you grew older. This is kind of your experience as a kid. Oh no, I enjoyed church definitely. Um, we went to church very faithfully. It was not an option to stay at home. I just, I remember writing this out. I remember a crazy Saskatchewan Sunday. It was like minus 45 and we went to church. We just didn't shut off the vehicle, but we went to church. <laughs> so very diligent. Yeah, my growing up, we had a manse right beside the church. So we went to church in minus 45. We didn't have to start the vehicle. We walked 10 steps to the church. <laughs> in fact, sorry, in Yorkton, when my dad was pastor at Yorkton, the, uh, at the back of the church was a small apartment, so we lived in the church. The church was my playground area, so there was no excuses for missing church, unfortunately. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. kind of like mine, yeah. Uh, Corey. Well, uh, I also grew up in a Christian home, and my parents brought us to church all the time. Our church was uh, a little different than Joanne's. Uh, the leaders at our church 
for all raised Old Colony Mennonite, but they had started a new church that was more along the lines of Billy Graham uh, type teaching and, and that. So there was a, there was, um, the gospel message was there. Uh, I remember, though, growing up very fearful. There was a lot of, the, the teaching was uh, a lot on hell and fearful stuff and uh, their face, your faith without works is dead was their strong point and it, to me it just, uh, I started having this feeling that uh, you have to actually work for it. For salvation, it was a works-based salvation. That, that's how I took it, anyways, growing up. And so it wasn't, it wasn't really a good experience for me because there was lots of anger and fear in our home. And going to church was a fearful thing. <coughs> After the message, you'd always walk away feeling condemned and fearful about where where do I stand with God, you know. Mm, yeah, I've heard that before, and that's some other people's experience as well. Going to church and then leaving. The, uh, I actually had a conversation not that long ago. Somebody was saying I went to church, went home, thought I was doing good this week, went back to church the next Sunday, and thought, "Oh my goodness, now there's more." And then I was just feeling condemned again, and just leaving condemned in a, a fearful attitude. So, as you grew older and could make your own decisions, so now we're out of your, you know, it's. You're getting into your own decisions. Uh, was church an important part of your life still? Did you walk away from the church? And the reason I ask this question is because they, the new statistics are 70% are of young people actually walk away from church uh, that have grown up in the church. And so uh, I, I want to know your experiences. And, and in that period of time, what were your thoughts towards the church and towards God? Uh, were they the same? Possibly they were different as well. So... Um, as you made your own research, was church still important in your life? Uh, yeah, I definitely enjoyed church for the most part. And definitely in my younger years, it was it was fun. Um, it was very peaceful as well. So, uh, since the location of the church that I grew up in, it was in a small hamlet that was situated between two dairy barns. So you'd often see a cow <laughs> while you're, you know, just meandering past. And it was, it's a, it was a very peaceful... This was in Saskatchewan, not yeah. in the... Uh... <laughs> Yes, okay. <laughs> it was just a very peaceful setting for to have a church, and it was just kind of out of out of all the busyness of life. And uh, but I think looking back on it, I I can say I I think my sort of exit, so to speak, from the church was more because I got a distorted view of God and how Corey was sharing about the fear and condemnation. Um, Somehow that came onto me as well, and I, I believed he was angry and a judgmental God, and that at any time he could uh, strike me dead. I was actually told that once, actually. You be careful. God could strike you dead. So there was that fear factor there for sure, um, and uh, I, I became very fearful of God, so I just pulled away. So what kind of age were you at at that time when you exited the church? I'm not even sure. I'm guessing, because it was not church. We had to go to church as long as we were living at home. So it must have been kind of 15, 16, 17, <laughs> where it became. But I'd go to church. I would just play cards in the back of the bench because right. I was tuned out. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Did you, uh, Was your vision of God and the church similar? Like some people exit the church and they say, I exited the church, but I, I always knew God loved me. But was your perception of God the same perception you had of the church at that time? I don't think so. I, th I just both both of them felt like the people maybe were uh, the distorted view that I had was maybe that the judgment that I felt from God was also coming from the people around you too. So it must have been the same. Yeah. Corey. Yeah, that sounds much the same with me. Is that by. 15, 16 years old, I was tuned out and started rebelling. I, I never, uh, I'd have fights with dad 
And just, basically, I'm not go going to church anymore, and they try to force me to, and sometimes, sometimes it would get physical, and I'd just say, no, I'm done. And uh, eventually it got to the point where they were going off to church Sunday mornings, and I was sleeping in, so. And yeah, I just, by, by the time I graduated high school, I was no longer going to church or, or anything. So. Did you still have a belief in God at that time? Yes, yeah. I always had a belief in God. I just felt like I would never measure up to what he wanted me to be, so. Right. So, just before we get to the next question, how, how long do you think you actually left the church for? How many years before, when you exited before you came back for both of you? With a year? Until we got together, okay? sort of. I had already started uh, coming back to church about 25. Like, so, you're talking about a about seven years, yeah, eight years, so seven, seven, eight, seven, eight years. years, yeah. Okay. And something similar? Yeah, five, something like that, okay. probably, yeah. So, um, was there a significant event in your life? You're both out of church. You're not attending church anymore. You've felt condemned. You feel like God's <coughs> angry at you, and you've got a distorted perception of God. Was there a significant event in your life that made you more aware that Jesus is real and that I need him to be an active part of my life? I guess like the, the roundabout question is, why did you start going back to church? Well, for me, I, I, uh, it didn't take me long to get... Uh, I left church and by the time I graduated from high school, I was in the party life and it didn't take long for me to get to hit rock, rock bottom. Like the prodigal, I was living in a pig pen, and I knew I needed help. So that that I need, I thought, well, I got to go back to church because that's the only that's the right direction, anyways. Is what I thought at the that's time. That's the only thing you knew. Yeah. Yeah, to get back on track. Okay. And I had one friend that I knew went to church, and so I I asked him one day, "Can I start?" coming to church with you. So that was my first gradual time back. But it was it was a church similar to the one that I grew up going to. So it was just started the same feelings that I had as a teenager, the reason why I left. But so when you went back to church and those same feelings started coming back why you yeah, left? Yeah, and I didn't know what how to deal with those but I just kept going back, so. Okay. And still struggling with lots of the mess and the addictions and stuff that I, that I gained being away from church for those years. Joanne, question three. <laughs> I'm, I'm all mixed up now, I don't know. Oh. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, as Corey's sharing, I'm thinking maybe this wasn't my really first going back to church thing because I remember when we were living in Mormon that we hadn't gone to church for a while and it was like I'm going to church this morning and I was hungover and I'm like I'm going to church this morning <laughs> and so I did and that started a little bit of that process of going into a Pentecostal church and that was way more different than what we knew. Can you just hang on a second? So you're together and you're going to a Pentecostal church? I did. And he morning. was going to a different church, or were we you weren't going to church. No, uh, we met. We met uh, before this. Uh, I was going to church regularly, and when we met, we started. We we got married at the church I was going to. Okay. But it began to be more sporadic, and then we started going to a church in Saskatoon. Oh. Okay. Uh, the more the more trendy church and and uh, but we were we were tired of it and so it just became sporadic so right at this time that she's talking Jesus. about we weren't going oh, okay we weren't going again and if we did it was once a month or something and and uh, so we were living in Mormon 
and uh, I'm sleeping in, but she's saying I'm going to a different church. Okay. So, well, let's pick it up from there. So, was there a significant event that <coughs> said I need to go to church this morning, or like you said, you were hungover and yeah. thought I'm just going to church? I guess it was. I don't know. Actually, really, what I see. I think. Our church hopping, if you want to call it, was more, when you look back at it now, we were looking for what we were, what we got now. Because in all of our guilt and condemnation and shame and all of those things, you can't stay there. It, it's just, it wears on you. And I think at that point, looking back now, I'm like, I understand now what, we didn't know when, what, we didn't understand when we were going from church to church, what we were looking for, but now I do. Mm, yeah. But as far as a significant time where we knew we needed God in our life and um, that we had to get actively involved in church again, probably, I'm going to cry. That's, good for you. that's okay. Cause it, Kyle. It's <laughs> Kyle will make sure that you laugh instead of crying. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, that's good for you. It always gets me. Um, we were pregnant with our first child. And between... The sixth and seventh month of pregnancy, they were given a devastating report that after a routine ultrasound, we were told that our daughter was a pound underweight from where she should be, and her head was very swollen. So we asked them, well, what does that mean? And they basically told us that she was going to be a handicapped child. We were... Um, even asked if we wanted to terminate the pregnancy. Oh, we said no to that. We changed doctors after that. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing, hey, today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was a that was a blow to to us. That that was when we we needed Jesus. What, what are we going to do with this? But at, this, at that time, as we were going through this, after our first ultrasound, Joanne's texting or talking to our best friends, the ones who uh, introduced us, uh, Joanne and I, to, to each other. And uh, they were at the time going through a marriage uh, course in a small group. I don't know if anyone knows of MMI. Yes. Yeah. 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 Marriage, Marriage Ministries International. And so it was, they were in group with different people from different churches, and their leaders were leaders from Pentecostal Assembly, all now the neighborhood church. And uh, our friends, I remember uh, Rose telling Joanne, uh, we're going to pray for you, uh, but I'm going to get our leaders to pray for you because they prayed differently than us Mennonites. Is, is how she said it. Wow. You know. <laughs> they pray differently than us Mennonites. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she said it. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> and uh, and so they started praying for us and and uh, I just, we're just okay, you know. Like we're still at the point where you know my my first thought wasn't even to pray to God because from what I knew from my upbringing it's just basically That's his well. will whether mm -hmm. whether he's going to heal or whether he's not so it's it's not really in my hands so but we we were thanking them for praying and so they continued to pray and then our next ultrasound we got a the the male uh ultrasound guy and he uh in the same office in the same, in the same office, office but a different yeah. person and uh he uh started the ultrasound and he's staring at the screen and uh you could tell he was he was frowning at it and he was checking something else and and uh we we're like okay what's something worse or yeah, what's wrong now right yeah yeah and so we're he's He's staring at it, and we we're just finally like, "What? What's wrong?" He says, "Nothing. Your child is perfect." We even left the room. To he, talk. he left the room, 
Yeah. He said, my, yeah, he left the room first, right? Mm -hmm. And then he came back and we're like confused. Now we're scared though, yeah. right? Because yeah. right. yeah. what is going on? Yeah. And he came back and he said, uh, I just went back to talk to my colleague who did the first ultrasound. She didn't make a mistake, but I, we have no explanation for this, but your, your daughter is healthy and perfect and regular. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And she's here with us tonight. She is. Yeah. She's got a beautiful singing voice and yes. she plays the harp and the piano and the, uh, that's an awesome. And to go yeah. back a little bit on yeah. what we just shared there, I remember I was laying in the hospital bed. This was during the time where they were praying for us. And I'm, I'm in the hospital bed and I look at my tummy and I see light. Healing. Wow. So that was really cool to, <laughs> to see light illuminating from your body. That was wild. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty powerful. That's awesome. I, and I like how, Corey, you uh, touched on how we were brought up, or you were brought up, to say, well, if it's God's will, it's God's will, and whatever happens, happens. I guess this is God's will. Uh, where now you know, hey, wait a minute, sickness is not God's will, mm -hmm. and we can actually pray God's will be done, which is, uh, by the stripes of Jesus, this person's healed. And so there had to be a shift take place mm -hmm. yeah, there in was your mind. Not instantly, like we kind of shocked, and it's like, it, it's almost like how if you read in the Gospels when when uh, Jesus performed the miracle of uh, multiplying the loaves of bread and the two fishes, it says that uh, the, the disciples did not discern the miracle because their hearts were hard. Mm. And it that was probably, looking back, what was with me, because it took a while for me to for it to really dawn on me as we started but once it started dawning on us, we started looking into the more charismatic uh, Pentecostal teachings, and and that's when that's when in Warman and Joanne decided, I'm just going to go to a Pentecostal church. Okay, where we come to that, where she she wakes up and she she says. She's going, and I'm saying I'm staying at home because I'm too scared to go to a church like that. <laughs> I'm, too scared. I'm too scared. Yeah. Well, boy, I've got a church I could have brought you to a few years ago that yeah. would have scared you. Uh, so, Janae is born then already at this time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's... Yeah. And then we also went, I mean, we're living in the city, and this is kind of just our introduction to these little steps of there's more to God than what we know, these little prompts, right? And then, so we're living in the city, we get a flyer, we're living on the west side, we get a flyer in our door saying, Todd Bentley is coming to Saskatoon. And uh, so we had no idea at this point anything about... Ooh, that would have scared you because Corey uh, back then. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, no, by then I was curious. Yeah, <laughs> now, you know, it started. <laughs> so you know, whatever happened with Janae there was like, there's more to God than what we know. And right. how do we find him? How do we search for him? Where, where can we go to get more of these um, experiences and, and just a greater relationship, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we got that flyer in our mail, we are like, yeah, I think we should go. And that was another kind of step. It's like, oh, we get in the vehicle, I'm just like, I've never experienced that before. <laughs> <laughs> I want that. <laughs> Uh, he's, I don't know if everybody knows who Todd Bentley is, but uh, he's got tattoos on his head and his arms and a big long beard, and uh, boy, he, he's, he can be he pretty radical. He didn't come out that night, though, did he? His plane was cancelled Oh, a <laughs> uh, snowstorm, I think. Oh my. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but it was still a very... Uh, it was a very, very anointed session, that's for sure. interesting evening we experienced God there, definitely. So then, at this point in time, like, did you guys start going to church together? Uh, you know, taking Janae and at this time, yeah. and it was a little while after that we started uh, going to the Pentecostal church in Mormon. Yeah, you went alone the first time, and then you were so, 
excited about it coming back that, that I went with her the next Sunday. She and, dragged you kicking and screaming? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I was curious by then because yeah. we had already had the experience at uh, Todd Bentley uh, Crusade there. Right. So, or those meetings. and So I was curious. So Good. We started there. So that was when we actually started actually going back to church and having and, and growing with God. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, assuming that, I'm assuming that you're in a church setting and uh, different things, God's done a lot of these things in your life. What were the things that led you to this message? I call it extravagant grace. Other people call it hyper grace. Um, I actually don't like the term because, uh, like somebody said to me, grace really is grace. Um, we just don't believe it, right? But it's all that always been there, always has been there. And there's grace in every denomination of church that you actually attend. There's uh, there's a, a grace there. So uh, because people know what hyper grace is or extravagant grace, uh, what were uh, the things that led you to this awesome message of extravagant grace well we were living in Mormon but I had already applied for and gotten a, the job in Hepburn and so we were packing up to go but we as was what we always did uh, back then was we always had the miracle channel on while we were doing stuff in the house and on the that particular day one of the shows that came on was uh, Peter Younger uh, presents, and uh, he was, and we just, it just caught my attention, and I just stopped and kind of started listening to him and his show, and there was something inside me that uh, I just felt uh, drawn to what he was saying, and he was presenting. Uh, he called it the cursed no more package and I was still struggling with a lot of a lot of stuff back then like I would we were getting better we were there were great things that were happening at the Mormon church for us we had good experiences there but I was still struggling a lot with stuff and uh, so I ordered that that uh, David it was called the curse no, no more uh, package and in it came a a book by jo Joseph Prince, Health and Wholeness through the Holy Communion. Yeah, that, I got that book. That was in the package. And then uh, Peter Younger's teachings, Peace and Goodwill in Your World. And uh, The Blessing is Irreversible. And we started listening to that. We ended up moving to Hepburn first and, and that. But finally we okay. took that out and started listening to that and that was something different than I had ever heard before and we were like we soaked it up we'd listen to them like each CD like three times you know constantly it's listening constant to this way. how could it is it this good like talking about uh, the the blessing that it's irreversible once the blessing has been given, uh, God doesn't take it back. Right. And some, maybe some of you don't know who Peter Younger is, but uh, he's a Canadian pastor. Uh, I think he's back in Ontario now. Uh, and who has been preaching the grace message for a few years. Kim, uh, he's actually Pentecostal background. Uh, and uh, I've been at a few of his meetings over the years before he was, uh, you know, start preaching grace and after. Uh, also, Corey had uh, told me before the service that some of this stuff that he's brought here, uh, if something kind of touches your heart uh, and you'd like to borrow some of this stuff, uh, he said that's uh, right. Then. That's that's yes. what, that's yeah, why he I brought it here, yeah. to, so that you you could borrow it and maybe you can do that too. So, so it was you were just watching or you had the Miracle Channel on and there was Peter Younger and, and that was your uh, kind of trigger. That was kind yeah. of the connection to this grace message so and then the, the book that came with it we we're just like oh this isn't peter younger and this is some other guy here yeah so uh, we we went and googled this guy because we did 
we liked the book, but we wanted to find out more about it. Didn't know who Joseph Prince was. No. Yeah. And then it brought us to a church website in Singapore. So I thought, well, that's far away. <laughs> <laughs> but before I even clicked on the first one to go to the church website, I just scrolled down for some reason before that, and there was something that said uh, Singapore Human Rights Commission. And so I clicked on it and read the story, and I guess it was about uh, this, this guy, Joseph Prince. He had a letter against him because two women had come there, and uh, he'd allowed them to uh, be in their church for, for a long time. And uh, they were, I guess they misunderstood his preaching of, of grace and they thought that he was preaching that it was okay for them to have a relationship. And uh, for, they had been, been in the church for a year and then they found out that uh, grace changes us. It doesn't give us the excuse to stay the same. Mm. And they, uh, I think the reason I say that is I, I think that uh, had I not gone there first, I may have dismissed Joseph Prince as as a false preacher, you know, because that he's just preaching, you can do whatever you want and live any way you want, and God's grace covers you. Like, license to sin. Yeah, I, I would have maybe taken, so I, I'm, I'm glad that actually I was led to read that first. And that's the only reason I say that, it's just, so then I go back to his website and I'm like, now we are soaking in his teachings and just the difference in what I heard from him that it was fo that you were you are to focus on Jesus and what he's done for you not on all the stuff you have to do for God right and how he, he's imputed a gift a free gift of righteousness to you and that God looks at you as righteous he doesn't look at you to judge you for you he looks at you as righteous and perfect in Christ yeah and that was a radical message that we hadn't heard before and if we had we missed it right yeah. so are you guys growing in this together or did one kind of just kind of leap and the other one kind of come along or are you just kind of just no, for me, I, I said, I don't really know if I have a definite answer for this, but I said, watching him grow just pulled me in too. And then all of a sudden, now I'm growing, I'm earning, and I'm, you know, I've got four Bibles out on the, on the bed, and I'm just, I'm, I'm just hungry. Like, it's like, it was like starvation for years, and now all of a sudden it was like, this is what we were after. This is what God wants us to know. This is the truth. And so it was more watching him start on it and the changes that happened through him and um yeah and just realizing like you know the it's a great exchange life it really yeah. is yeah. and it's there's so much more to this just the same grace because we we're talking it's like everybody understands grace everybody nods at grace yes grace this is different this is the great exchanged life yeah and I love that. um and the whole uh, for me, the word sozo is very powerful. The whole Greek word is, of sozo, where you're saved, you're uh, rescued, you're sound mind, you're delivered, you're healed, you're preserved. All of those things is, is in this one word, and that it was included in that great exchange life. Yeah, and sozo, for some of you that might not, that's that's the Greek word that when you say, and you are saved, you are sozo. Uh, or salvation sozo and it's all included and so sometimes I think sometimes when we get saved all we know is that we're saved from hell right. but we don't know any of this other stuff that we it's actually got prosperity in there yeah. as well and all these things that sozo you get all these in that salvation mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful truth um, and then it's not based on you because if it's G did Jesus deserve all the blessings yes and so do we, right? Because we are, he gave us that in that sacrifice. Right, yeah. And so you end up in a little church in Saskatoon, uh, uh, Abundant Grace, and uh, you went through an experience there, and, and uh, we're kind of a shoot-off of Abundant Grace, or we're kind of uh, 
we, uh, there's some people that have went to Abundant Grace that are part of us, and you're one of those, and Elaine is one of those, and Jake. Uh, and uh, so um, we're still in this wonderful grace message. This extravagant grace, this exchange life. I love, I love that word because uh, uh, it's that's a that's a good thing at the exchange that happened at the cross. So I wanted to know what is one of the most significant truths you've learned as you've journeyed in grace. What is one of those things that just sticks out above the rest? Because there's so many good things. I don't mind. Mine's healing. <laughs> Healing. Healing. Uh, yes. But in it's, that it's so exciting. so life and in that great exchange life, that um, in his sacrifice we were provided for healing so we can live healthy and whole. And so this book definitely had a huge impact on us personally. Um, I had been diagnosed with endometriosis. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. It's basically scars up all your tissue and it's a big mess and it's very painful and so i've been diagnosed with that and after we had our first child they said you're not going to have any more kids and so health for us was probably the biggest one along with the communion <coughs> and to see the finished work through the cross through jesus and that he wants this for us so it was always i guess my take on growing up was you weren't really sure if God really wanted you to do all these things or if he would, or if you took out a step of faith, if he would join you there. And so this was just a great confirmation that yes, God wants you well. God wants you healed. God wants you to succeed because for so many, for so many years, I believe he was basically wanting me to fail, like just set you up for a failure. And so this was just a whole new dynamic for, for myself personally, for us as a married couple, and for healing in our body, it was just, it was huge. Um, so yeah, that's, that would be the biggest one for me that's included in the grace package was the healing. Yeah, that, and that's why I'm just gonna grab this here for a second. And go ahead. Yeah, and that's, that would be for me as well. And part of that, of learning how to live in health and wholeness uh, just the the important uh, part of what condemnation does to your body and and how Joseph Prince teaches on what the effects that condemnation has to our physical bodies and and living under that and what how it's important to understand the gospel in order to be free from condemnation because that affects, that brings deadly effects to your bodies. It's constantly living under condemnation and just learning that part and how, how it was the law that brings that condemnation. Paul called the ministry written and engraven in stones a ministry of death right. and a ministry of condemnation. Yeah. And, and so just to see the, see the difference and to see how we had been mixing two covenants up until now. Uh, not knowing any better, but that's what we were doing. Mm -hmm. and, and the complete difference between the covenant of law and the covenant of grace and how that gets, how they teach that, both Joseph Prince and Peter Younger. Yeah, it's got a different cover on it, but this little book here is the one that changed my perspective on communion because one of the things that brought me to grace was this whole idea where Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Uh, in fact, in John chapter 12, he says, even if you don't listen to me, I don't condemn you, or I don't judge you. And then going through communion, and as a pastor, handing out communion, uh, in a, and we're still being condemned because we're saying, well, uh, you know, you've got to check yourself. Uh, if you don't line up, it, it, you don't even take communion. And uh, some of us here, uh, I know I have I've actually refused communion in the past because I thought it was it, it was not good for me, right? Uh, this little book has uh, changed my life. I was just looking it up on Kindle. It's $9.99 on your Kindle. Uh, Health and Wholeness Through Holy Communion by Joseph Prince. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a, a fabulous book. When I understood, for example, that... Um, <laughs> 
it doesn't actually say examine yourselves for sin. It says examine yourselves how you're taking communion. Because in chapter 10 of, of 1 Corinthians, some were being gluttons and they were getting fat and others were getting drunk. And he's like, how are you doing this? Don't you realize that, uh, and when I began to realize even, it's not about getting sick when it says, if you do this in an unworthy manner, some among you are sick and some of you asleep or you die. It's, uh, it's not about getting sick or dying because you take in an unworthy manner. It's you are already sick, you are already dying, and you're not getting healed because you don't understand the power of communion. Uh, that, that book, you can see it's small, 47 pages on the Kindle. This is uh, a must. Health and wholeness through Holy Communion uh, is a must a book for everybody to have in their library. It's, it's awesome. Uh, let's go back to my questions here. So, um, well, yeah, number six. So I see Corey's got a bunch of stuff here. I want you to give us a suggestion of one or more of your uh, favorite Grace teachers and, and why they, uh, how they have impacted your life or why they're one of your favorite teachers. Uh, who are you listening to now? Who are you reading now? Authors, speakers? All right, for, for me, uh, Peter Youngren definitely started us on this journey, and uh, I, he's relatable to our story. Um, I, yeah, he's had failures, right? They're, they're, he's been very public that he's had failures, and uh, which totally backs up, for me, just totally backs up the grace message, that in spite of himself, in spite of his failures, God still uses him. And he's bringing hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord in spite of himself. Especially in Muslim countries. Especially he's there. Being, he gets yes. invited where nobody else can go yeah. in Muslim countries and has... Uh, Incredible favor. Uh, yeah, but they're not called services. They're called... Friendship crusades. Cr crusades with hundreds of thousands of Muslims mm -hmm. attending these uh, crusades. It's, it's, it's amazing what he does. Yeah, and that to me is just such a powerful testimony that... You know, when we look at ourselves and, oh, I failed, I can't do this, I, I can't, I'm not going to step out. And, he, you know, he's failed and, and God is just, that's grace. That's truly grace to me. Festival, that's the word. He has these grace festivals, festivals yeah. grace festivals. That's right. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also Joseph Prince, definitely, due to the simplicity. I, I never grew up reading my Bible a whole lot or I just like the little stories out of there. But um, what Joseph Prince could do is that he could really pull out, especially in the Old Testament, he could pull out things that I've never seen, never heard, never understood, and make it so simple and apply it to the new covenant of grace and just unveil Jesus everywhere. And to me, that just opened up a whole new story. I just love how he takes the Hebrew and he says, see this here, blah, 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 this is a fence, and this is, <laughs> and, and he's, yeah. like, he's a Hebrew scholar, and uh, just, oh, just mind-blowing. But it's simple, you can, you can understand it, like it's he just takes the story and makes and just strips it down and it's just Jesus standing there no matter which verse he does that to. Right. So yeah. awesome. Yeah, I'd probably say the same to Peter Younger and then Joseph Prince have been the most influential to us. Uh, we've listened to other ones too, like Andrew Womack is great too, mm -hmm. listening to him and and even guys like there's one guy here I can't even pronounce his name, but is this book is awesome. Like, uh, Blaise. Oh, uh, Blaise. Blaise. No, Blaise. 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 He's Blaise. German. Blaise. Uh, high German or something? I think his name is Blas. Okay. I forget. That. But that book, uh, it's finished why you can quit religion and trust oh. Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's finished, yeah. That's an amazing book. So that guy is. So, uh, yeah, just basically... Uh, just the way that they are able to expound and take Jesus out of the scriptures. Like it said that uh, in the scriptures, Jesus is hidden in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. And Joseph Prince and Peter Younger are very good at uh, bringing Jesus out of the Old Testament and how they can see Jesus. Joseph Prince says, when you read the Old Testament, 
Read it to find Jesus. Don't read it to find do's and don'ts and what you must do. Read it to find Jesus in the Old Testament because he's in there. Lots. Yes, absolutely. And on every page. Yes. Because the Old Testament, I mean, Jesus says it's a shadow of things to come. If you're, he says if you would have listened to the law and the prophets, you'd actually see me. That's right. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, I was just trying to think of this other grace preacher from Norway. You probably know who he is. Oh, I can't remember his name. He's old, old. So what's a good old Norwegian name? Oli? <laughs> Oli in Spain. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I know who you're talking about. You know I can't talking. remember his name. Because oh, yeah. Peter Younger has talked about him. Well, yes, because he was, yeah, uh, yeah he had been with Peter Younger and Anna had been with Joseph Prince at right. uh, some time. I just yeah. can't remember. I don't know. No. no. It's, uh, yeah, it doesn't I know who you're talking about, though. Yeah. I can't remember his name because it's hard to pronounce his name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll think of yeah. it. I'll bring it sometime. That's awesome. So I hope you possibly have learned some uh, different uh, perspectives, uh, some different journeys, even maybe even some different uh, teachers, some different books, uh, some different authors that you can uh, get some really good stuff on. Uh, Grace, there's there is a website. I'm just I'm going to give you guys the last word here. Um, it's uh, Paul Ellis has a website called Escape to Reality, and on there. He's got the 50, his 50 favorite grace books. Uh, and on there, he's got his top 50, I think it is, right? 50 grace books by all different authors. And you could go on there and you could uh, uh, check out uh, some different uh, books. But it's escapetoreality.org. And uh, just look up best grace books or whatever. And there's uh, 50 different books there. Some of them are the same authors. Not 50 different authors, but... 50 different books. You have the mic. What words of encouragement would you like every person to hear uh, tonight? Or did I miss something? You can go back and get something too. I just, uh, I did want to, this is something that I just felt I needed to share. Um, there was so much fear for myself growing up that the gospel really didn't seem like the good news, right? And so I believed God was out to get me when I did wrong. And uh, so my view was so warped of God. But I remember we had this intense storm on the farm, this lightning, and it was just wild and crazy. And I remember, and I feel it so strongly, that I believed I was the cause of it because God was judging me, right? And so I believed I had something to do with this vicious storm, and he was kind of judging me back on this. This is my view. And that fear that came from that. And so I was convinced that God was judging me and I hid underneath the staircase, begging and pleading for my life because that's the fear and that's the view I had of God. And so I guess what that leads me to is that in my, for in my words of encouragement is that that fear's gone. Amen. Amen. Cause it really is a great exchanged life. And so Jesus got what I deserved. And in his perfect sacrifice, I am accepted into the family of God. I am loved forever and accepted forever. And that never changes, no matter what. And it's because of his love and sacrifice that I no longer have to live in that fear. And he is truly for me. He wants me to succeed, and he wants me healthy, and he wants me blessed. And there's no questions asked. And it's the same for you, because he's no respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. Corey? Yeah, I, I think that's good. And one of the things that I'd like to say, like I, I've always uh, stru struggled. The Word of Faith has great preaching on faith and healing and that. What I always struggled with was I didn't, I didn't think I had enough faith to receive the promises, to receive healing in that. And one thing that uh, Joseph Prince and Peter Younger has has uh, helped me with, especially this book from Peter Younger in the Faith That Works, where he uh, he talks about uh, 
you can let go of trying to have enough faith and receive Jesus' faith as a free gift. Yes. Because yeah. he's, right. given, he's given us his faith. Yeah. And his faith yeah. is going to work a lot better than mine. So yeah. but we can we can just rest in his faith. Yeah. And, and let his faith work through us. And that's been instrumental uh, for me. I, I don't think we see the healing that we've seen without that revelation. Mm. Because I always felt like the the faith messages were good they were biblical but i always felt like i was a day late and a dollar short with faith and uh so that that was very instrumental and in, with that uh with us seeing that and i think just uh just the part where uh what grace means what is grace and uh so this is what i'd like to end off with it's yeah, just easier absolutely. for me to read Joseph Prince and for me to try to say it so uh, but what is free what is grace uh, it's a devotional here uh, free and undeserved and since it is through God's kindness then it is not by their works their good works for in that case God's grace would not be what it really is free and undeserved that's Romans 11.6. And then Joseph Prince uh, has his devotional. I love the Apostle Paul's description of God's grace, free and undeserved. When you truly experience this free and undeserved favor and love from God, you don't have to worry about performing. His love and unmerited favor within you will flush out all the wrong thinking and wrong believing that you will that you will produce good works, true fruits of righteousness that are lasting, sustainable, and enduring. You may have heard a teaching going around where grace is defined as divine empowerment. Be careful about defining grace as merely empowerment. That is diluting and reducing what grace truly is. Grace produces divine empowerment but in the end, but in and of itself, the essence of grace is his undeserved, unmerited, and unearned favor. When, you, when are you in your most undeserving state? When you have failed. Unmerited favor means that when you have failed and are in your most undeserving state, you can receive Jesus' favor, blessings, love and perfect acceptance in your life let me tell you that when you understand and receive grace as god's unmerited favor not only will you be empowered you will be healed and you will be changed from the inside out the real danger with defining grace as just divine empowerment is that we have unconsciously flipped grace around and instead of seeing it as God's work in our life, we make it our work. From being centered on what Jesus has done, that erroneous definition of grace as empowerment swings it to being about what you must do and how you must perform. How, how that now that you have received this grace, this divine empowerment, can you see this? With such a definition of grace, the onus is to live the life, the Christ life falls back squarely on your shoulders. My friend, make sure that what you believe in your heart always points back to Jesus and Jesus alone and not to yourself. Remember that it is all about his work, his doing, his performance and his love in our lives. It never points back to you. Don't be hoodwinked by those who move away from the pristine definition of grace as God's unmerited favor and end up making it all about you and what you need to do. That's not grace. Grace is God's doing from inception and all the way to the end. Today receive his abundant grace. See that God has already started a good work in your life and he alone will lead you and give you the victory in your area of need.
Grace is God's doing, His work, His performance, and His love in our life from inception and all the way to the end. Mm. Awesome. It's all about Jesus. Yes. It's unmerited favor. Uh, it's that song he says, I don't deserve it. Uh, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> What's that? Reckless love. I'm glad you knew that. <laughs> yes. Uh, reckless love. I, I like that part too. I'll uh, just briefly just uh, what you said about faith and it's Christ's faith. And we know now we even have a better in Galatians 2.21 where it says, where Paul says, uh, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Not yet, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live now, I live, and uh, our version say, by the a faith of the Son of God, or in the faith of the Son, or by the faith of the Son of God, or by faith in the Son of God. Um, and if you go to the Greek, it actually means it's actually I live by the Son of God's faith. I live by His faith, and uh, it's just a just a amazing thing. Hey, give them a hand. They did a wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for coming and doing this for us tonight. Uh, I just have a quick little devotional, I guess, to share with you. I want you to know tonight that God has a plan. God has a plan. Uh, and there's a really popular verse that we use in the Bible, and it's halftime at the CFL game, by the, or the Grey Cup game, by the way, and Calgary is winning 21-11. <laughs> uh, and we know this verse pretty good. You, you probably all know it. It says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. And we often use these words for encouragement and to encourage others. And we should. I think we should. I think we should know that God's got a plan. Uh, but why, I think the question is, why did God have to remind the Jewish people of this promise in the first place? Some of the stuff that was, is written in the Bible, we should ask the question, why would they have to write this? Why didn't they just know this stuff? Have you ever had children and you're like, why do I have to tell you this? <laughs> you should know this. Why, why do I have to tell you to clean your room? Any parents have to tell your kids to clean their room? Why do I have to tell you to clean your room? Or, or you used to have to tell your, parents, your kids to clean your room? Uh, and, and so why did God have to, to remind the Jewish people of this promise? And, and you look, and the children of Israel are in exile in Babylon. Uh, and they weren't living in the land that God had given them. They had been displaced. They're not in the land of milk and honey. And they're under the rulership of the Babylonians. Uh, I, I don't know if you've been in a place where you know you it's pretty good. And then you're displaced and you, you know, you're, you're feeling discouraged. Uh, the Israel here, they're, they're, they know they're God's chosen people, but now they're under the rulership of the Babylonian, Babylonians and they feel discouraged, they feel frustrated, uh, they felt forgotten, possibly abandoned by God, and here we are in Babylon. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Have you ever been discouraged, frustrated, you felt forgotten, uh, maybe even felt abandoned by God and, uh, and you're all alone? And they, they needed to know some things. They needed to know that they were going to be okay. They're going to survive. Uh, and they're going to return to their homeland. That's the, and so God says, hey, I've got a plan. A uh, plan to prosper you and not for calamity. And we often quote Jeremiah 29, 11, But we should actually start in verse 10. Because verse 10 says, For thus saith the Lord, When 70 years have been completed for Babylon... I will bring, uh, sorry, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place. Then it says, for I know the plans I have for you. Uh, and, and so we often quote that one verse, uh, and, and then actually we could go on to verse 14, uh, into, well, I guess verse uh, 12 first. Then you will call upon me and come to, and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I love this. I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. I'm going to bring you back. And so we find here that 
you know, while we can take this personally, actually, when you look at the whole verse, it was given to a nation. And he says, after 70 years, and if you go back through history, they were in ex exile, the Jewish people were in exile in Babylon for 70 years. Um, and, and so uh, when they're looking at this prophecy as a nation, right, uh, they had something to look forward to. I'm sure that some people died in that 70 years, but there was something more. Their children were actually going to go back to their land. And, and uh, so even in this prophecy, it was to the nation of Israel, but it wasn't going to happen now. You're going to have to wait 70 years. Uh, and so when you look through history, Israel was in, exact, uh, in Babylon exactly 70 years. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking... 70 years? I don't even know if I'm going to live another 70 years. Uh, you know, how does this apply to me? And I've got good news. Because this specific prophecy was for the nation of Israel. And Israel is still in existence today, 2,500 years after this prophecy. And so 70 years in 2,500 is actually a small period of time. Of course, the fulfillment, I mean, there was, there's lots of fulfillment of, in this prophecy. There's Part of it was fulfilled when Jesus came. Part of it was fulfilled probably in 1948 when uh, Israel became a, a nation again. And all these people are gathered back. And, uh, and so, uh, but, but at that time, God said, you're going to have to wait 70 years. And 70 years for a, a national existence isn't that long. For a personal existence, that might be a long time to wait. But God has a specific prophecy for your life. Just like he had a specific prophecy for the nation of Israel, he's got a specific uh, prophecy for your life, and he wants to bring his plan to pass in your lifetime. Can you say, in my lifetime? In my lifetime. Yeah, in your lifetime. Uh, and But uh, here's the thing. You s might still have to wait. <laughs> you ever had a promise and then you had to wait for it? Uh, you know, you might have promised your kids we're getting into that time. Christmas is a month away from today. Yeah. And our, yeah. And our kids want their presents, but they have to wait. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. But you have to wait till Christmas Day. Uh, you know, Isaiah writes in Isaiah chapter 40, they that wait. You could actually put that rest. They that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. It's like every night we get tired, we go to bed, and we wait. We rest, and we get our strength, or we have our strength renewed. And sometimes the plan God has for you, <laughs> I know, this is going to bug some people, is to wait. <laughs> Elaine is like, no, I don't like I'm waiting. Tired I'm waiting. tired of waiting. Is to wait. Uh, you know, if we jump into things... You know, uh, uh, how, uh, uh, if we jump into things, we may miss th what God really had for us, a better thing. Like if I would have jumped into getting married when I was younger, I would have missed Mary. I mean, Marianne would have missed me. <laughs> I mean, that was the best thing that ever happened to her, right? I was getting pretty old by that time. Uh, she was young and, uh, you know, uh, but, and, and sometimes we have to learn, and, and Hebrew says this, rest. Know that it's going to happen and wait. Now, can I ask you a question? Do you know God has a plan for your life? Do you know the plan God has for your life? And, and sometimes our lives look like the plan must have failed. And as I was thinking about this this week, uh, you know, I went curling on Tuesday night. Our team had a bye. And so that means I didn't have a game. But I showed up just to see if anybody was short. I'm about to put my, uh, just to, you know, sit down and go home because nobody said they needed anybody. And all of a sudden, a guy comes around the corner, out of the rink, and says, hey, you got your stuff? Get on. You're coming out, and you're the skip. <laughs> and I'm like, the skip is the, 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 guy, the, the guy that tells everybody what to do, right? And uh, so I get out there, and there's two other guys. Uh, they're both <laughs> pro golfers, by, by the way, but they're really bad curlers. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so they're both <laughs> golf pros, and I'm their skip that night. And uh, in curling, I was thinking about this, the skip always has a plan. He puts down the broom, he calls for an in-turn or an out-turn, 
and he wants you to throw that rock. The problem is the skip, even though he puts down the broom or she puts down the broom, they have a plan. They're not the ones that are in control of the rock. The person at the other end of the ice is in control of the rock. And when they let that rock go, maybe they've let it go too light. Maybe they've let it go uh, too heavy. Maybe they put the wrong turn on it. Maybe, it's, maybe it, it, something happens to that rock. And all of a sudden what happens is they may have missed the mark. Or maybe they, don't, they got everything right, but they excuse me, missed the broom. And so the rock is way over here instead of over here where the plan was. And what the skip does is he forgets that shot. So they've missed the mark, but they've got another plan. They said, okay, we're going to do this next time. And the plan continues. And, you know, I grew, I, I, I had this idea at one time that God only had one plan for my life. And if I missed the mark, I messed up God's plan. Have you ever thought that way? I don't know about, I, I thought that way. And all of a sudden this week, God gave me this illustration. When I missed the mark with the curling stone, I may have missed the mark for that shot, but there's another shot coming. There's a new plan, and there's always a new plan, and the plan is always to have victory, always to win, and God always wins. And so I was just like, I was like, wow, that's good, thank you, God, that even though I missed the mark, we call that sin in the church, but even though I missed the mark, you still have a plan. And I was thinking about uh, a girl... Uh, in the Bible, you know, or I should say, <laughs> when you're skipping, you have plan A, but you always have plan B, plan C, plan D, all the way up to plan Z, because you never know what's going to happen, you know, what's going to happen with that, but you always have this plan. And I was thinking about this girl in the Bible who probably maybe even felt that her life wasn't planned out too well, and maybe I was thinking about my mom, because her name's Ruth, she's got a whole book in the Bible named after her. Uh, you know, she lives in the land of Moab. She's a Gentile. Uh, a Jewish family moves to Moab because of famine in Israel. Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, they have two boys, Malon and Chilion, and Elimelech dies. So the two boys are looking after their mother, and they get married. And now this is kind of interesting. The Jewish guys get married to Gentile women, which really was prohibited. It, wasn't, it was against the law. They, they weren't supposed to do that, but they do it. And they, about 10 years later, they're married for 10 years, and both boys die. Now you've got three widows. Naomi's got nobody look left to look after her. Her husband's dead. Her two boys are dead. There's nobody there but her. And she hears that the famine in Israel is over, so she goes back, and Ruth would not leave her. She says, where you go, I'm going to go. Where you die, I'm going to die. What you eat, I'm going to eat. And Ruth doesn't have a hope. And when you think about Ruth being a Gentile, uh, Naomi, they get to the border and Naomi's saying, Ruth, stay here with your people. And what she's saying is, if you cross into this border, really you don't have any hope because these Jewish men aren't going to marry a Gentile girl. You're going to be single the rest of your life. You're going, you're going to be poor the rest of your life because there's nobody here that's going to look after you. I never thought about it that way before, but this Gentile woman moving into Israel and she's without hope. We know that they're poor because Ruth goes out and she's gleaning from the fields and there's this law that God had made that anything that accidentally touches the ground from the, from the harvest, you're supposed to leave it for the poor and the needy for them to come pick up. And while she, Ruth is out there, she catches the attention of a guy named Boaz. <laughs> And Boaz says to his servants, oh, by the way, I would like you to uh, uh, accidentally on purpose drop some of that stuff on the field for her. Uh, it, 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 once it's down there, you can't pick it up. Do it accidentally on purpose so, so that she has enough. And we know the story how Ruth actually ends up marrying Boaz. But her life, I'm sure she's like, God, what did you plan for my life? I got married. He died. I'm here. There's nobody to marry me. And God's got a plan for her life. And all she's doing is just living in the flow of life. And she's doing what she knows to do. Pick up the, uh, the crumbs left in the field. And she catches the attention. And she goes from actually the servants leaving stuff behind for her to marrying Boaz. And now she is the owner or the boss of the servants that were leaving stuff behind. Not only that, 
This Gentile woman marries Boaz. Boaz has a son, his name's Obed. Obed has a son, his name's Jesse. Jesse has a son, his name is David, who is the greatest king of Israel, who is now the lineage of Jesus Christ. This Gentile woman who her life was messed up, God says, I've got a plan for you, and I've still got a plan for you, and you're gonna be the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes we don't know what that plan is, but we know that God's got a plan. There's a, a man in the New Testament, in, in Luke chapter 2, you can read his, about him. His name's Simeon. And God has a plan for his life. Do you know what the plan for his life was? He wouldn't die until he saw the Messiah. That was, the, that was his plan. That's all we know about him. And it seems like the writer of Luke, this guy must have been a really, really old man because how he writes it is... Simeon sees Jesus and he's like, oh, thank God, I've finally seen the Messiah. Now I can die. <laughs> like he's looking forward to dying because he's just so old that he's like, I've seen the Messiah. Now I've fulfilled the plan and now I can die. His whole plan was just to see Jesus. That was his plan. God had a plan. And I want you to know that God's got a plan for your life. And it doesn't even matter if you've missed the mark. God's always got a plan. There's another stone to throw. There's another end to play. And in the end, we win because our skip is Jesus Christ. He's the one that actually throws the last stones. He's the one that has the, the last say. And, uh, uh, I, I, and, and Marianne's here, you know, like, uh, I, I can share this. Uh, I've shared this before. And uh, uh, I was engaged to another girl before Marianne. And she was with me too long and she dumped me. Can you believe that? No. <laughs> Two and a half years uh, later and uh, I thought, I one time thought that God only has one woman for you, that's it. I found out that he still does, but it's only after you say I do. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's right. that's, that's, it's only after you say I do. Um, if I would have thought, oh my goodness, this girl, she dumped me, so she's missed God's will in her life because I'm good. I'm, I'm the best, you know, <laughs> like the best she could have ever had. If I would have thought that way, that would have meant that she has power to mess up my life. Mm -hmm. And that's just not true. God's got a plan. And his plan for me was Marianne. Do you, if that wouldn't have happened, it would have happened a different way. But God planned Marianne that way. The, the stone was thrown and a different plan was taken. I'm so thankful that I got Marianne because I got the better deal. She got the worst end of the deal. But I got the good deal. So I want you to know tonight that maybe life has thrown some curveballs at you. Maybe you've thrown a stone and it's missed the mark. Maybe it was too light or too heavy or missed completely. But God still has a plan for your life. And you're going to see it fulfilled. You're not going to have to say, wait 70 years. Because whatever God's plan for you will happen in your lifetime. Isn't that good news? It's gonna happen in your lifetime. He's the God of the second chances. He's the God that doesn't just have one ultimate. I used to believe this. There was the perfect will, there was the permissible will, and then there was outside of his will. And if I got out of the perfect will, which was the center, then there was this permissible will. Ugh, oh, man, that just is confusing. I'm just gonna follow Jesus. And he's got a, a plan for my life, and that's all I'm going to do. Amen? Amen? Father, I just thank you. You have a plan for us. You have a plan for our church. And we speak that building into existence right now in yes, Jesus' Lord. name. We thank you. You have a plan. And so we're going to walk down that road believing in what you have for us in Jesus' name. I thank you for the healing you have for our church, the healing for those in our church. And we just declare that in Jesus' name. We thank you that you have a plan, and your plan includes healing. And so we grab that, we receive that, 
In Jesus' name. Just bless each one that's here. We bless each one that's listening on Facebook and each one that's listening on YouTube. We just pray your blessing on them today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.